Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? The same murder three. Strange things that I've been hearing. Stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree? Welcome to Strange Things, broadcasting from the Raimundo Rios Mayo Library in Arkansas. And welcome to the show. I am your host, Chris James. It's February 4th, 2017. This will be season number two, episode five. Tonight, we're going to be doing a show on ghost hunting. Ghost hunting 101 if you will. You've watched every episode of Ghost Hunters, and you can name all the members, plus you know their families as well. You've seen Paranormal Lockdown and Ghost Adventures so many times, you can recite the lines. Ghost Mine is your favorite binge show, and you tried to be a guest on Scariest Places on Earth just so you could meet Linda Blair. Now what? You decided you want to be a ghost hunter, and now you're going to follow in the steps of your heroes. So, how do you get started? First of all, it's not nearly as exciting as it looks on TV. You must realize Hollywood has a preconceived notion as to what a ghost hunt should look like. Lots of scary music and running around screaming, and there has to be something caught on tape in order to show the audience. That's not quite how it really works in the real world. I've been on a ghost hunt, several, and mostly it's a lot of walking around looking for any sign there might be something there to show itself on either tape or film. If you're going on a ghost hunt, you want to be sure to wear comfortable shoes or boots. There will be a lot of walking. Now then, when it's time to sit for a bit, you have to be still and listen. In the TV shows, they sit there and they'll have a long, drawn-out conversation about things that most ghost hunters should already know. That's all Hollywood. In the real world, any conversations are in whispers and they are very short. Now, don't get the wrong idea. Ghost hunts are fun, and sometimes they're exciting. I just not like the TV shows. If you decide to scream and run, you may as well just keep going till you get home. Maybe you should try finding a group already established in your town. Most paranormal groups are always looking for help. You can search for any group in your town and then give them a call. Ask if it would be okay for you to tag along on a ghost hunt. More than likely, the answer will be yes. If not, look for a different group. There are some that just don't want outsiders hanging around, but believe me, those are few and far between. You may want to hang around for a few hunts before you go and join. If you watch and listen only to discover you know twice as much as they do, and you've already joined, you'll have to figure out how to unjoin. Plus, you'll be stuck with a bunch of black t-shirts with their logo on them. Every ghost group just loves their black t-shirts. If the group invites you to attend a ghost hunt, be on your best behavior. Show up drunk and they'll run you off. Don't use any kind of controlled substance, including that stuff some people like to smoke. Believe me, it won't enhance the experience. It will make you a liability to the group, and they'll send you home. If you want to use all the proper words, check out the Atlantic Paranormal Society dot com glossary and definitions. You'll learn such things as the Alma, Russian wild man encountered in Siberia and northern China, generally described as being covered in hair and powerfully built though shorter in stature and more human-appearing than the Yeti. Some researchers have suggested that 
Alma may be descendants from Neanderthals. If you're not too sure who the Atlantic Paranormal Society is, you've been watching them on Ghost Hunters. They go by the name TAPS. Never enter a building or property unless the owner okays it. If you get caught, you might wind up in jail. If you get hurt, then no one's going to feel any sympathy for you. This is something you want to know before breaking any laws. Ask the person in charge if the owners are aware of your upcoming investigation. It never hurts to ask, but it might hurt a whole lot if the owners press charges. Ask. There are some groups out there that consider other people's property nothing to be concerned about. Trespassing is trespassing even if it's an abandoned house. If the property contains lots of valuables and some are small, you might consider inviting the owner to come along on the investigation. If they don't want to get involved in these things, see if they will at least have someone there to see you coming and going. Show them your gear. Let them see anything that you're taking out the door. This will hopefully keep any questions coming up later as to where some missing item might have wound up. It's always a good idea to have someone along who represents the owner. It will open doors that sometimes are locked to outsiders. Now, someone in the group should be able to answer whether the place is safe for an investigation. I'm talking asbestos for one thing. Sure, you can run around breathing asbestos all day long and not get sick. It takes years for your body to to show signs of exposure. Well, then it's too late. Once your lungs go south, you're not going to enjoy it. Also, is there any part of the structure that is not well ventilated? Poisonous gases can accumulate in basements and underground tunnels. Most of these gases have no smell, and you don't know you're breathing them until it's too late. A little knowledge in the beginning will save some major headaches later. Now is the structure sound? Are there huge holes in the floor you might step into? Are the stairs in good shape? Way back when I was young, we used to drive down to Galveston Island and we'd sneak into the old World War II bunkers that ran from one end of the island to the other. There had been three 15-inch naval guns mounted along the shoreline in underground bunkers, there to defend the ship channel. There were tunnels and rooms all over the place. This was a really neat experience, and we had a lot of fun running around down there. It was super dangerous, but we were young, and we thought we were immortal. I wish I'd had a camera back then. I wasn't thinking about capturing photos just exploring. Some of the underground facilities had collapsed. Other parts were getting close. All that salt water was having an effect on the concrete. Also, there were openings in the floor that had held lifting machinery that was no longer in place. Just a big hole that dropped down about 20 or 30 feet, and there was no ladder or other way to get back out should you have accidentally fallen in. There were tunnels that ran out onto the beach, and these had led to machine gun bunkers. The army had been preparing for an invasion. And, of course, there were the stories of unsavory folks living down there who would kill you for your clothing. But we were young and thought we could handle it. There's not much left of the place today. and Take a look on the Internet. Just search for Fort Crockett images, and you'll see some of the places that we were exploring. We're going to take a brief pause here, play a couple commercials. We will be right back after this, so don't go away. You're listening to Arkanasa Radio.
Do you have skin? Would you like to take better care of it? Call Lourdes James, independent beauty consultant, and set up an appointment. Call 723-3019. If your vision isn't what it used to be, and you're not sure you're seeing Bigfoot or just your neighbor mowing his lawn, stop on by Del Norte Optical, 107 Calle Del Norte, just across the street from the Embassy Suites. You should be able to see what you're looking at. Looking for a great cup of coffee? Swing on by the Organic Man Coffee Trike. 1002 Eaterby Day, Suite Number 7. Not a coffee drinker? They have hot chocolate, hot tea, and sometimes muffins and cookies. It's a great place to meet your friends for a conversation or curl up in the corner with a good book. The Organic Man Coffee Trike. Life is too short to drink bad coffee. No, don't say goodbye. Stay with us. This is Arcanelza Radio. Quédate con nosotros. Estás escuchando Arcanelza Radio. You're listening to Strange Things with Chris James. And welcome back to the show. Now, we were talking about the importance of safety during any kind of a ghost hunt. If I'd have known I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. Don't get hurt. Pain is pain, no matter how it arrives. Now, is there someone in the group who knows something about emergency medicine? Do they really know, or did they just watch a lot of episodes of Life in the ER? Having someone along who can remove a splinter or tell you if that spider bite is something to worry about is a good idea. And then there's communications. Communicating is a good idea at all times. Some folks like to use walkie-talkies, but you can use your cell phone as long as you have a signal. Someone in the group should have already checked to see if their phone worked in and around the property. If the tower is close, well, you're in business. Texting might be better, so you don't interrupt an EVP session. Be sure to get everyone's number and set your phone to vibrate. If you're like me and you have spooky message notification, you might cause a huge mix-up when you receive a message. If, on the other hand, there is no cell reception, you should have a walkie-talkie for each group. So if something happens or there's an emergency, you have a way of communicating. Zach, Aaron, and Nick from Ghost Adventures will tell you. Do your research. Once you've chosen your location, do your research. It is important that you know what to expect, as it will determine the equipment you use. The team you'll need, emergency procedures, and any permission you may need to seek before embarking on your ghost hunt. Find out as much as possible about the ghosts you may encounter. When do they appear? Where have they been spotted? Are they vocal? It's important that you don't waste your time and plan as much as possible beforehand. Before entering the property, the LPRS hold a prayer a quick request for God to watch over them so they don't get any nasty surprises. If you're one of those folks who doesn't believe in God, well, pray to whatever spirit you consider will be there for you. It's a good idea to be a skeptic, look at each piece of evidence as if it's something other than a spirit, but then there are those folks who, if a ghost were to come and sit right down next to them, they'd act as if they didn't see it. If you're a total skeptic, 
the kind you see on TV, and they deny everything on the planet. Stay home and watch TV. You'll only get in people's way with all that nasty, noisy, negative naysaying. I'm just wondering, what does an atheist say when the fertilizer hits the revolving air distribution center? Just picture it. An atheist is hanging from a cliff, about to fall to their death, and he or she says, what? I'm just asking. If you're going to hunt ghosts, you should dress for the location. We investigated an ice rink one time, and boy, it was cold. A good thing I had on warm clothes, boots, and a jacket. Maybe some gloves and a hat would be good, too. If you get too warm, you can always take things off. But if you get too cold, you'll just be miserable. Ask the group what to expect as far as the location goes. If it's an old, disused building, you'll want some good sturdy boots instead of running shoes. And long pants are always a good idea. You might consider bringing something to drink. If the building is abandoned, there won't be any water, so bring your own. Also, if you think you might need to use the bathroom, is there going to be any place available? Ask before you get there. And just to be on the safe side, take a Ziploc bag with a bunch of those wipes used to clean babies' bottoms. They will come in handy if you get something on your hands or should you suddenly discover a need for the bathroom. If you're going to bring any cool guy gear, one thing you will need is a good flashlight. A headlight is even better, but you just might need light. Don't rely on others to supply something that might be needed to save your life. Make sure your lights work and bring extra batteries. Spirits have a tendency to drain electrical equipment. I usually carry a flashlight, and I have a backup flashlight, and I have a headlight, and I always carry enough batteries to resupply all of them. All my lights use the same size batteries as well. This makes it a lot easier to bring the right batteries when you need them. If you bring a camera, be sure it's in good working condition. If the camera has a smear on it, you might think you caught a good ghost photo, only to discover it's just a smudge on the lens. People will tell you, you have to take the strap off. Eh, not necessarily. If the strap is secured around your neck, it won't be a problem, and this will lessen the chances you accidentally set your camera down and then forget to pick it back up. My digital camera has a sound setting. I turn off all the sounds, so all I get is the photographic picture, but no click. This might sound extreme, but if you're standing at the end of a long hallway and you click a photo... Someone standing at the other end just might hear the click and mistake it for something otherworldly. It only takes a minute or two to eliminate the sound. Now, when you go to take a photo, do you want or need the flash? The flash will blind you in the dark. You'll see things you can't see if it's too dark, but then you'll get shadows that might fool you into thinking you have something. Some folks say use a flash, and some say don't. Try both ways. See which works best for you. Now, my Sony camera comes equipped with an infrared setting. It's not super powerful like the Army night vision, but it works in very low light. This makes catching images easier, since I'm not blinding anyone with my flash. And flash photography at night is going to mess with your night vision. You're going to have those blue swirly dots floating around in front of your eyes for several minutes after you take a picture. This just might be the time you miss something important. Take two or three photos each time. If you take just one photo and there's something spectacular showing up, the naysayers will accuse the image of being lens flare, 
or a reflection or some such. So take two photos so you have something to compare the image with. Also, with two or more, fo two or more photos, you can compare one to the other. What if something just moved? Say that doll sitting in the corner is suddenly in a different location. Let's say there's a shadow that is now in a different position. This would make a really great catch if you're lucky enough to grab it. Do not smoke cigarettes. If you're standing in a room puffing away, and then you leave behind a small cloud of smoke, and then the next group walk in and they click some photos, the smoke will look like a disembodied spirit. Now, will you be one of those people who knows the image isn't real, but you can't bring yourself to admit it? Leave the cigarettes for when y'all are on break and everyone knows you're making the cloud. If you're shooting a video, don't swing the camera around so much. I've watched way too many videos where the person behind the camera moves from room to room, but you never get to focus on anything. Any video camera with an automatic focus will take a few seconds to set. If you're moving around, the camera can't focus, so you won't see anything. Stop slinging the camera all over the place. Move in slow, easy manner and give the equipment a chance to work. As you enter a room, swing the camera slowly to one corner. Then, slowly move from one side to the other, letting the camera capture the entire room. This should take about 20 seconds. It sounds like you're moving too slow, but later, when you're reviewing the video, you'll be glad you took your time. Next, move to one of the other corners and repeat. Slow, easy movements. With digital camera, this shouldn't be a problem. If your memory card is too small, you should get a bigger card. Now, if you have the money and are willing to spend it on gear, check out the High Definition Action Camera Eyewear. They run from $40 to $150 at Amazon.com. When Ishmael and I were down in the basement of an old abandoned hospital, we would never have caught that wow image if not for his glasses. His were infrared and they cost about $150. He'd stopped and turned to say something to me, but instead he said, well, what was that? We looked around with our flashlights, but we didn't see anything, so we just wrote it off as a shadow. After the investigation, Ishmael downloaded his video and then watched it on his computer. Just as he's turning in my direction, he sweeps a doorway with his camera glasses. Right in the middle of the doorway was a huge black mass that looked almost human. It was coming at us, but in the dark of the basement, it was barely visible. If not for those video glasses, we would have missed this weird-looking spirit. It was about the only wild thing of the entire night. I covered this in the book, The Laredo Paranormal Research Society, but the image was too dark to print. We would never have seen it if not for those glasses. It's up to you whether you want to spend this kind of money on what amounts to a hobby. And keep in mind, the best equipment in the world won't catch a ghost if it's not in use and in a location where the spirits are lurking. You also need to consider... If you do buy expensive equipment, you run the risk of loss through theft, damage, or just plain wearing out. Jason Hawes and Grant Wilson were able to buy a lot of cool guy gear because they had their own TV show. Most of that stuff looks good on TV, but you don't really need a lot of it. Keep it simple until someone comes along who's willing to invest in your group. Don't get caught up by new and wonderful things that people say will capture images of ghosts. There are lots of people out there all trying to make a living, and they're not all scrupulous. 
Think before you buy. Do you really need it? Will it really do what the sales guy claims it should do? If you buy it, will you still be able to eat tomorrow? Can you use something else and accomplish the same goals? Don't spend money you don't have buying things you don't really need. When you enter a location about to search for the departed, don't focus on looking or listening for ghosts. If you have all your attention on ghosts, every squeak and groan will be perceived as being from beyond the grave. Not every sound is a ghost. There aren't that many ghosts making all that much noise. Most of the sounds will be just noise. Try focusing on being there and see what comes your way. Just enjoy walking around and sitting quietly in a dark place and don't try to force it. Every so often, do an equipment check. Just about every half hour or so. That way, if some expensive piece of gear is missing, you only have to go back so far looking for it. If you've moved through an entire hospital before discovering something was dropped, you're going to have a long search to find it. It's not that involved. You should have your camera, your flashlight, a recording thing you're carrying in your hands because sometimes you set them down only to walk away and forget them. Things have gone missing with no explanation. You might be dealing with a ghost or you might have a nasty visitor. If you have the equipment and set up motion-activated cameras, try setting them so they cover each other. You just might catch a spirit messing with your gear. EVP I'm not going to say what EVP stands for. If you're going to be a ghost hunter, you should already know. Now you're about to conduct an EVP. Place your recording device on something stable and then have a seat. Relax. Try starting with an introduction. Tell the spirits who you are and why you're there. You want to get very far. You won't get very far by being rude. Ask in a polite voice if there's anyone there who wants to talk. Now be quiet. Give the spirit a chance to reply. And then you can follow with a second question. Now try coming up with a conversation before you start talking. Think to yourself. You're interviewing someone. You want to know who they are and how they're doing. I've been on a few ghost hunts where people would ask the same questions over and over. And think how you'd feel if people talked to you that way. Ghosts aren't slow in the head. You don't have to talk to them real slow or real loud. And keep in mind, at the evidence review, your friends are going to be listening to you talking. You might want to sound intelligent. Before the investigation, you could sit down and actually come up with a set of questions to ask. We are going to take a break now, play a couple of commercials. Don't go away, we'll be right back after this. You're listening to Arkanasa Radio. Do you have skin? Would you like to take better care of it? Call Lourdes James, Independent Beauty Consultant, and set up an appointment. Call 723-3019. If your vision isn't what it used to be, and you're not sure you're seeing Bigfoot or just your neighbor mowing his lawn, stop on by Del Norte Optical, 107 Calle Del Norte, just across the street from the Embassy Suites. You should be able to see what you're looking at. Looking for a great cup of coffee? Swing on by the Organic Man Coffee Trike. 
1002 Eater B Day, Suite Number 7. Not a coffee drinker? They have hot chocolate, hot tea, and sometimes muffins and cookies. It's a great place to meet your friends for a conversation or curl up in the corner with a good book. The Organic Man Coffee Trike. Life is too short to drink bad coffee. No, don't say goodbye. Stay with us. This is Arcanelza Radio. Quédate con nosotros. Estás escuchando Arcanelza Radio. You're listening to Strange Things with Chris James. And welcome back. We're discussing ghost hunting and some good ideas from around the country on how to be a successful investigator. I watch those TV shows where the stars get all rowdy and start yelling and insulting the spirits. If you were a spirit and you only had so much energy to respond, would you waste your voice answering someone you didn't much care for? Or would you go out of your way for someone who is respectful? and courteous. Try to acknowledge any activity you hear or see. I was reviewing some investigations for the Laredo Paranormal Research Society and Ishmael had asked if the spirit could open a door. The door swung open. He then asked the spirit to close the door. A short time later the door swung shut. He then thanked the spirit for responding to his request. The next time he goes back to that same location and asks for a spirit to interact, his chances are far greater because he was polite and courteous. Remember, ghosts are people too. Watch your step. Don't walk around in the dark assuming the floor is in good shape. You probably won't find a hole, but you might step on something nasty or step on something that might hurt your leg or your ankle. Be careful where you're putting your feet. Stairs. Some buildings are multi-story and the stairs are in less than serviceable condition. Be careful any time you're going up and down stairs. This would probably be, good, uh, be a good time to have your light out so you can see where your foot is going. Try to not grow frustrated if you don't get a response. You might not have a ghost around to work with, or the ghost might not be strong enough to do anything. And, also, ghosts are not our pets. They don't come running and do tricks just because we ask. Maybe they're out on a date, or eating dinner, or whatever ghosts do when they're not roaming around haunting a place. Avoid using perfume or cologne. And check with the others with you. Don't walk around sniffing each person. Just take a casual sniff before the group breaks up to see if anyone is extra specially potent. Now, as you're moving about the investigation site, take a deep breath to see if you pick up any kind of aroma. Be careful if you're in an old abandoned building... Sometimes the homeless folks will use the floor in ways it's never intended. On occasion, people have caught the smell of a perfume or a cologne belonging to the departed. Some ghosts actually do smell good. If, on the other hand, you smell sulfur, you're probably not dealing with a ghost. You're dealing with some other entities. Bad smells don't always mean bad spirits. There just might be a broken sewer line or someone passing by who's in need of a bath. Don't, don't jump to any conclusions. You're there to investigate, not assume. Erin Pavlina says on her website, erinpavlina.com, Pick the proper location. Paranormal activity can occur in all sorts of locations. For example, hotels, cemeteries, prisons, hospitals, 
private homes, parks, bridges, scenes of accidents, major disasters, or murders, etc. Anywhere that residual energy might dwell. What kind of ghost do you want to encounter? Lost souls? Murderers? Accident victims? Demons? Do you want a playful spirit? Are the really angry ones who will push you down a stairwell if given a chance? Pick a location where reports include the type of energy you'd be likely to encounter or investigate. You may not want to lock yourself in an old abandoned mental ward until you've been doing this for some time. Way back in 2002, before ghost hunters were quite so popular, there was this blonde from England, Yvette Fielding. She was well known for two things. She went to haunted houses and did investigations in England, and she screamed and ran away a lot. Now, if you're going to some place that you think is haunted and you suspect you just might encounter something, is it good form to act like you're crazy and run around screaming? If you're looking for ghosts and you find something like a ghost, be happy the ghost has bothered to respond to you. If you're easily scared or you just don't have the composure for it, maybe ghost hunting isn't your forte. You can still be an asset to the group by volunteering to help out during the review. Sometimes the review is far more exciting than the actual investigation. The review is where most of the good stuff is found. Ashlyn Brown, researcher, author, and forensic investigator, has some good advice should you find some strange substance that just might be spirit-related. Firstly, you need to document and photograph everything carefully. If you try to rely on your memory, you probably won't. You find a strange substance on the floor or the wall. Use something for size comparison. A tape measure or a ruler works best. Take photos from all sides. Write down where you found it and who was there at the time. Write down about any smells or sounds that you perceive as well. Take your sample and place it in a paper bag. Ashland says, I would definitely say paper Bags are over plastic if possible. The plastic can help degrade the sample. So if you have an investigation kit, you might want to check on your storage containers. No plastic bags if you can help it. Paper bags are best. Ashland has three books out on Bigfoot. If you have a young reader who can't get enough of finding Bigfoot or Monster Quest, check out the Secret of Black Jack Woods, The Secret of Hoke Farms, and her latest book, Beyond Black Jack Woods. All are available from Amazon.com. At a predetermined time, the investigation should come to an end. This should be decided before you'd start. That way, if someone doesn't show up at the rally point, the others will know to go look for them. Things happen sometimes, and it's always a good idea to have someone ready to come looking for you if you get hurt or lost. At the end of the investigation, be sure all your gear is with you before you leave. Now is the time to figure it out, not once you're home getting ready for bed. This is also a good time to share anything odd you saw or heard. The others may just determine to stay on a bit and Check things out, anything that's new. A closing prayer is in order. Just ask that nothing weird or hostile follows you home. My wife always tells me to be sure nothing comes home with me. You might not want to pick up any souvenirs. I've heard from a few investigators who picked up some little trinket at an investigation only to find there's something otherworldly sneaking about their home later on. 
Once the investigation is through, it's time for the review. This is when you're going to go over all the photographs, the video, sound recordings, and try to pick out anything of interest. This is a time-intensive project. You have to look at each photo and try to find things that don't look right. Then you have to figure out if the anomaly is a bug or a bit of fog or actually something paranormal. Every photo, the video has to be scrutinized as well. The LPRS get together and they put the video up on a big screen TV and then the group goes over the images together. As anyone spots any kind of an anomaly, they write down the time and then they run the tape back and enhance the image and have a closer look as they, as they can to, to see what they're looking at. With several eyes on the screen, this allows them to catch more oddities as well as rule out anything explainable. They try to have a good time with chips and sodas, but hold off on the beer until after the review is over. If you're not having a good time during the hunt, why are you wasting your time? Ghost hunting is not a job. It's an avocation. An avocation is a hobby or a minor occupation. Jeff Meldrum said, Instead of calling Bigfoot hunters amateur investigators, they should say they're avocational investigators. Now, doesn't that sound better? So from now on, don't call yourself an amateur investigator. Call yourself an avocational investigator. So why spend your off hours doing something you're not really enjoying? This may explain why those who do enter the old buildings looking for spirits of the dead are so fervent about what they do. They all have jobs to pay the bills, and then they have their avocation, which is what they do to live. You have to approach any possible evidence as a skeptic. What is this other than paranormal? What can it be? Go down the list of anything and everything it might be and eliminate each possibility. This doesn't have to take long. You look at the image of the photo and say it's, it's not a bird or a bug. It's not smoke or reflected light. Then you can start to speculate what it might be. This is where the double photos come in handy. You can compare one to the other until you know what it is or is not. Is this a lot of work? Yes, it is. Is it worth it? Yes. When you finally find something that can't be explained away, you now have something to tell the world about. It's the thrill of the chase. The Laredo Paranormal Research Society have open house events on occasion where they invite the public to come and see what they've found. A library makes a good location. There's lots of parking, and since it's free to attend, the library is open to the public. If you want to do something like this, you should rehearse your presentation. Make sure it sounds good, and you want the public to see it as uh, worth listening to. People in the audience will weigh what you say as well as how you say it. This is one of the best sources for future investigations. People in the audience show up because they believe or they have seen things out of the ordinary. Maybe somebody in your audience is looking for a good, discreet, reliable group to come to their property and look into something they're concerned with. When dealing with the folks who have a legitimate concern, you want to be there to help them. Yes, you might find some cool paranormal evidence, but your primary concern is to help anyone in need. If you should discover there's a real problem, don't just tell the owners, yep, your place is haunted, and then leave. You should have somebody to call should, the, should you find there's something other than a ghost. Something like what you saw in The Exorcist. On occasion, you just might have to call in the professionals, as in someone to chase off the nasty elementals. 
Do not try this yourself. If you find something evil, you're not trained or equipped to drive it away. Sometimes things get exciting and you're the one who offered to help, so help. This is something to think about before you offer to investigate, not once you've found things that is scaring everybody. The website, ghoststudy.com, they have some tips for potential hunters. Things like let them, the ghosts or spirits, know they are not forgotten. Let your journey in the field of study be a labor of love. Remember to be respectful of ghosts and spirits as they were once people, and still are for that matter. Never tease or threaten or dare an unseen entity. First of all, we want to be taken seriously. Secondly, we are ghost hunters, not bullies. Lastly, we sure don't want any vindictive entities following us home or, worse yet, attacking and hurting us. Conduct yourself as a professional at all times. We're going to take a brief pause here, play a couple more commercials. Don't go away, we'll be right back after this. You're listening to Arkanasa Radio. Do you have skin? Would you like to take better care of it? Call Lourdes James, independent beauty consultant, and set up an appointment. Call 723-3019. If your vision isn't what it used to be, and you're not sure you're seeing Bigfoot or just your neighbor mowing his lawn, stop on by Del Norte Optical, 107 Calle Del Norte, just across the street from the Embassy Suites. You should be able to see what you're looking at. Looking for a great cup of coffee? Swing on by the Organic Man Coffee Trek. 1002 Eaterby Day, suite number 7. Not a coffee drinker? They have hot chocolate, hot tea, and sometimes muffins and cookies. It's a great place to meet your friends for a conversation or curl up in the corner with a good book. The Organic Man Coffee Trek. Life is too short to drink bad coffee. No, don't say goodbye. Stay with us. This is Arcanelza Radio. Quédate con nosotros. Estás escuchando Arcanelza Radio. You're listening to Strange Things with Chris James. And welcome back. Now, we've already gone over some good suggestions from the Internet. We always want to present ourselves as one in control. And that, of course, means around other investigators, victims of a haunting, and even the ghosts themselves. Self-confidence and control will radiate like a beacon of light and thus serve as a shield of protection. The site also covers such things as how to take pictures of ghosts, how to hunt for ghosts, how to record ghost voices, standards and protocols for ghost hunters, and equipment used for ghost hunting. If you're in the Laredo area and would like to know more about ghosts, or you think you just might have something that you need help with, you can contact the Laredo Paranormal Research Society on their Facebook page. There's also a book out about their endeavors, I just happened to have written it. Check out the Laredo Paranormal Research Society at Amazon.com. If you need to pick up some ghost hunting gear and don't know where to look, 
try ghosthuntersequipment.com. The guys at TAPS have all the things you need. Dowsing rods, EMF meters, EVP equipment, as well as books on how to use all these things. If you're looking for some good reading material, maybe something to while away the hours while waiting for the next hunt, Jason Hawes and Grant Wilson have several books available at Amazon.com, so check them out. At GhostHunting.com, you may find the things you're looking for but can't find in other sites. Learn all the ins and outs of how to prepare for and then conduct and follow up on a real professional ghost hunt. This tutorial should help inform you of ultimate purpose of ghost hunting, the techniques, equipment used, and how to review and follow up on a case. If you've seen it done on TV and are wondering what steps to follow to begin ghost hunting on your own, then this is the section is the most read for you. We leave no stone unturned, literally. If you like ghosts, but you don't want to spend the night in a nasty old building, you might want to look into ghost tours. The San Antonio is just up the road, and there is a ghost tour that starts off in front of the Alamo. If you think this is, if you think this just might be in your ballpark, check out the San Antonio Ghost Tours. Lots of walking, but without all the fancy gear. Now, if you happen to live up in the northeast end of Texas, maybe you should try Jefferson, the most haunted city in Texas. Look for jeffersonghostwalk.com. Come join historian Jody Beckenridge in Jefferson, Texas, considered the most haunted small town in Texas, thanks to the Discover Channel, the Travel Channel, and the Sci-Fi Channel. The historic Jefferson Ghost Walk has been mentioned in news articles and TV for years, including KTBS Channel 3, the Houston Chronicle, the Longview News Journal, and the Tyler Morning Telegraph. 8 p.m. every Friday and Saturday night, for the only tour that tries to take you inside the haunted locations. Now, Texas being so big, let's not forget the folks out west. Join the El Paso Ghost Tours on their downtown tour for a historic and paranormal experience that will not be forgotten. Their paranormal investigation experience begins as they give you a bit of history on the locations that they are about to visit. From there, the lights go off, the investigation begins. Go to ElPasoGhostTours.com for more information. Now, there are lots of ghost tours out there. All you need to do is have a look. So if you want to be a ghost hunter, go for it. Look around and find a group you can fit into or start your own group, but reach out to the well-established groups for ideas and support. If you like ghosts but you don't want to get in you don't want to get that involved, check out some of the ghost tours and then have a great time. If you have any suggestions for shows you'd like to hear, contact us at strangethings.arcanasa.com and and tell us your ideas. If you'd just like to listen to the archives of the show, go to strangethings.podomatic.com. All the archives are there, and they're free of charge. You can also listen to some of my books that I've written and I've read for the Internet. All the websites that I've mentioned on tonight's show will be listed on our Facebook page, Strange Things with Chris James just in case you want to investigate further. The book, the Laredo Paranormal Research Society, is a compilation of some of their past experiences and some of their more interesting ghost hunts, as well as some of the UFO hunts that they've done. You can't just go to a location and start clicking photographs and run a tape recorder and expect to solve a case or gather proof of anything. 
Also, it's against the law to just enter a location you believe to be haunted to do any kind of investigation. The LPRS always obtain permission from the property owner before any inquiry can commence. They did have some rather interesting experiences long before they had even become the LPRS. A Laredo police, police officer had contacted Ishmael about some strange activity near a call he'd been on. The officer had been responding to a domestic disturbance on Shiloh Drive. Near the call, he'd seen three abandoned houses that were all set side by side. After the call, he noticed a crucifix had been broken and left laying in the doorway of one of the houses. Inside the houses were all furnished that had been left by the previous tenants. The living room was full of furniture. There were clothes in the closets. The cabinets in the kitchens were filled with canned goods and dishes. In the backyard of these houses, the officer noticed there were grave markers. Lots of grave markers. There were more than 200, dating from the 1800s to the early 1900s. The markers were delineated from low-priced tin crosses to large stone markers. Somebody in Ishmael's little group of friends said, Hey, let's go check it out. Followed by, What do you think we'll need? If you've ever watched Ghost Hunters or Paranormal State or Ghost Asylum or any of the ghost shows available on TV, you will see the same basic equipment used by the investigators. A camera, some flashlights, maybe a baseball bat and a golf club. Impromptu weapons in case they find something they didn't want to deal with. Eight men jumped into a pickup truck, three in the front seat, Four stuffed into the back seat, and one poor soul got stuck in the back of the truck. They drove over to the site to see if there were any spirit activity. The area around the abandoned houses was as quiet as a tomb. The air was still. It was about 50 degrees out. The eight, soon-to-be LPRS members, went about looking into the graveyard to see if any of the ghosts could be seen. They moved about among the grave markers, not too sure how to investigate the scene. It's not the kind of thing covered in school. Take a few photographs, make a recording, ask some questions. When it began to rain, they moved inside one of the houses. The group was in the process of investigating when they heard what sounded like a horse whinnying nearby the back door. Looking into the yard, they could see nothing that could have made any such sound. Then it came again, right next to the house. Well, they decided they'd had enough fun for one night, and the guys all decided it was a good time to head home. Somehow, they managed to get their truck stuck. It took nearly two hours to escape from the abandoned house. After the group became the LPRS, they would return to the Shiloh Cemetery eight more times. The next time would be in 2004. The case number is 073. By the time they returned, they would have acquired much better equipment and a lot more skill at investigating. Check out the Laredo Paranormal Research Society, available at Amazon.com. This is our end of our show for tonight. Hope you've enjoyed it. Tune in next Saturday when we'll be discussing some other strange things. So until then, goodbye for now. Are you, are you coming to the tree With a strong upper man, the same murder three Strange things that happen here, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree